So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, last Lunch and Learn event of 2021, entitled People's History of English Speaking Quebec, Planning for a Community-Based Project for Community Vitality. My name is Patrick Donovan. I'm Research Associate with the Quebec English Speaking Communities Research Network, Questrin, uh, at Concordia University, and I will be your moderator today. And before continuing, I'd like to acknowledge the Ganyan Gahegar Nation, recognize the custodian of the lands and waters we're speaking from today. Lorraine and I are both in Montreal. Jojage, historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. We're excited to have with us today my colleague, Lorraine O'Donnell, Research Associate at Questgren. Uh, who is also an affiliate assistant professor at the School of Community and Public Affairs at Concordia. This event was made possible through the financial support of the Secretariat aux Relations avec les Québécois d'Expression Anglaise, uh, represented here today, I believe, by William Flock. Questprint also receives funding from the Department of Canadian Heritage, represented here by Valérie Girard, Helen Meredith, possibly others, and also from the Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities. So let me introduce our speaker for today, my colleague, Lorraine O'Donnell, who has a PhD in history from McGill, a master's in history from York University, and a graduate diploma in community economic development from Concordia's School of Community and Public Affairs. She is, uh, like me, a research associate at Questgrin, where since 2008, she's led the day-to-day -day operations and has been an absolute joy to work with. Uh, before that, she worked as archivist, researcher, teacher, public historian, and in 2015, she became affiliate assistant professor with the Concordia University's School of Community and Public Affairs. Lorraine's research focus is Canadian women's history, history heritage projects that involve and help build communities. She has contributed to English speaking history exhibits on the topics of immigration, Jewish and Irish communities, social movements, and uh, housewives during World War II. So Lorraine, the floor is yours. Thanks, Patrick, and you're a joy to work with too. Today, I'll be introducing our project, giving some examples of some people's history, talking about the situation we're addressing with the project, what the project ex itself involves, um, its status to date, and some preliminary conclusions. The project is being led and planned by Patrick and me. He's already introduced uh, my background. I'll add Patrick's. He also has a PhD in history and a background both educational and in practice in heritage preservation, notably working on the Morin Centre Cultural Centre. The funder for this project is Secretariat aux Relations avec les Québécois d'Expression Anglaise of the Government of Quebec. So let's jump into some fun stuff first, because some of this is more kind of administrative or, or an overview. Some people's history. Black Rock Group. The Black Rock Group established it in 1981 was a group of artist activists from Montreal's southwest boroughs of Verdun and Point St. Charles, commonly called the Point. That's where you can find these boroughs on the map. McGill Daly um, interviewed some of the members of the group in 1982 and was trying to get a handle on what it was and said, it's not easy to classify the group acts as a focus for working class for done cultural and political activities. And they also pointed out the author that it's uh, hard to pin them down. They have many varying points of view. Here's a partial list of the members. I've put David, David Finario in red. He's, he's um, probably the best known of the group. There's David Finario, a well-known Canadian playwright. The Black Rock Group ran a club and cultural centre uh, on LaSalle Boulevard in Verdun. 
Here's a picture I, I was able to um, dig it up on Google Maps. You can see it's a modest place. They were artists and activists. This is a portion of their manifesto, which is much longer. I just turn your attention to the second paragraph there. They're describing the Black Rock itself, uh, a picture of which I showed a, a few slides back. Not a bleeding heart of Christ or the head of holy fool John the Baptist, but a huge Black Rock, like a bad tooth pulled out of the river. And that black rock was in honor of immigrants who died in a typhus epidemic in the 1800s. Black Rock Group published, including a book called Blue Mondays, which if you haven't read it, I would recommend. They developed political positions. This is one quote I dug up. Um, it's not like Alliance Quebec sort of thing where guys are pissed off. Gee, we're not going to get a job here. If we don't get a job here, we're going to go to Toronto. These people here can't go to Toronto. They never wanted to go to Toronto. We want to stay here. And in that vein, they demonstrated as well. And it's hard to read the banner, but it says, Les maudits bloquants rest ici. In, um, English jargon, it's, you know, the damned Anglos were going to stay. And you can see it's Black Rock de Verdun. That's Black Rock Group. On to something completely different, Coasters Association. Founded a few years after Black Rock Group. Located in Quebec's lower North Shore. The red dot marks roughly where they are up near Labrador. There's a very pixelated photo of what it looks like. It's spectacular, beautiful. Their mission statement indicates that what they do is to develop knowledge of needs and expectations of their communities and act in partnership with various groups to develop and deliver strategies programs and services to people in their region. Here's an old picture, probably from 1989. Um, those of you who know Cornella Morris, who's still leading the group, she's second from the right. What they did and what they do. They promoted culture, heritage, and health in activities like a cookbook, which aimed to look at the food situation, um, nutrition, and food transportation in the Lower North Shore. Here's the introduction to a recipe by Mabel Wellman, 87. Another person, Shannon Keats, who's still with Coasters, did a study of women's needs up there. Another study was on early childhood development and service delivery in the Lower North Shore. So are these ordinary people? Um, those in the Black Rock Group and Coasters Association formed and contributed to English-speaking Quebec groups. They named and met identified community priorities, and they developed relationships with each other, with other groups, and externally. Which leads me to our project. The situation we aim to address is uh, declining vitality. A lot of research shows that the English speaking communities of Quebec are experiencing declining vitality at the level of institutions, demographics, and interestingly, Paul Zanazanian and others have identified a link between vitality and history. So Paul Zanazanian has identified low knowledge of the English speaking Quebec as a vitality issue. Brendan O'Donnell has identified gaps in the history of English speaking Quebec and others have identified a problem of lack of knowledge of English speaking Quebec by the majority population notably in the uh, high school um, history program here in Quebec. 
on uh, Alain Roy has talked more generally about a vitality of memory situation. And I we don't have proof at this point, but we speculate that there's low vitality of memory here. Our project, drawing on primary and secondary sources, will capture voices of ordinary English-speaking Quebecers working in community groups. The project will do, do so in order to preserve and share Quebec English speakers' history and promote their vitality and to amend the dominant narrative. What we hope to change um, is threefold. We want to make history and heritage uh, preserved and available. We want to enrich the scholarly literature and to contribute to the vitality, self-knowledge, and well-being of English-speaking Quebec. How do we aim to do it? Through a bunch of activities. We will be and have started reviewing the literature, conducting field work through archival and interview work, developing an open library I'll describe in a few minutes, giving presentations like this today, writing, and convening an advisory committee. What will be produced are the Open Library Database, PowerPoints and Publications, Partnerships, and Networks. So where are we with the project? Let's start with the scholarly literature, starting with people's history. Arthur Leslie Morton. He lived most of the 20th century. In 1938, he produced A People's History of England, which has been reprinted many times and was also produced in new editions. It's been described as laying out the main outlines and most important turning points of British history from the point of view of ordinary people in a clear and jargon-free style. Howard Zinn also lived a long time throughout the 20th century. There's Howard Zinn speaking out against the Vietnam War. He was a well-known intellectual. He wrote A People's History of the United States in 1980, and like uh, Morton's, his book has gone through many versions. It's comparable in scope, tone, and orientation to Morton's, but has more of a focus in its subject matter on collective action. Zinn wrote, I wanted in writing this book to awaken a greater consciousness of class conflict, racial injustice, sexual inequality, and national arrogance. Both Morton and Zinn have left quite a legacy with their people's history projects. Morton, for an example, um, inspired a new generation of historians who founded something in the UK called History Workshop, which among other things is a journal, um, which involved academic historians working with laborers and others with ordinary people to produce history knowledge. And they definitely saw history as a tool to bring about positive social change. Zinn has been hugely influential in history education, especially in the United States. So for example, there's a Zinn education project, which as you can see from the quote here from their website says, they want to equip students and all of us with the analytical tools to make sense of and improve the world today. Uh, Martin Lyons, an academic, has come up with an interesting typology. I don't want to um, emphasize a dichotomy there, but what he's saying is that we can classify the likes of Zinn, and I would add Mort Morton, into an old history from below. So history from below, the idea is looking at ordinary people in history. Um, Lyons says, though, that the old history from below tended to talk about mass action, collective mentalities, collective actions, and that there's a risk that that approach can be somewhat anonymous. 
I would say that Morton's and Zinn's legacy, the projects I mentioned just a moment ago of um, History Workshop, for example, and many other projects fall into another category that Lyons calls the new history from below, which is more grassroots, captures more personal voices, and sees ordinary readers and writers as active agents. So how does this all fit with our project? Borrowing from um, the people's history pioneers and other history from below writers, our focus will be on ordinary people as active agents. Our focus as mentioned is on groups, so collective action and face of challenges. And our purpose is positive social change, as I mentioned, to address the need for community vitality. There's a lot more literature we're tapping into. I won't go through it all, but here's an example of what we're looking at. Literature on Quebec community groups, history and vitality, minority histories, decolonization, English speaking Quebec history at large, and approaches like community-based action research. Um, just to look at a bit of this literature on community groups, Cheryl Gosselin, uh, our colleague and friend, has written community groups collectively do the work of negotiating language frontiers. They're involved in advocacy, lobbying, language protection, and cultural prom promotion. And they give English-speaking Quebec members the basis to craft a space of belonging in Quebec. Anna Krasinski has written about Quebec community groups. Women, especially those positioned as low income, often motivated by caring and nurturance, are at the heart of progressive community activism. Désirée Rochat, who's written about Black, Creole, and French-speaking communities, argues that people, no matter who they are, whether they can read or write or not, are producers of knowledge about their own realities and potential actors of political change. That's literature about communities. I'm also, we're also, as mentioned, tapping into literature about how history and heritage links to vitality. I'd like to cite Alain Roy, a colleague, who's written about the concept of vitality of memory. And those of you might have, some of you here might have attended his lunch and learn a couple of months ago. He says, vitality of memory strengthens the social bond and identity, prerequisites for sustainable development. A large scale study of University of Liverpool concludes that what they call interventions, so sort of planned structured interactions between individuals and groups and heritage assets, such as archives or built environments can have a wide range of beneficial impacts on physical, mental, and social well-being of individuals and communities. So we're tapping into this kind of literature both to understand the communities we're looking at and also what benefits might emerge from our project. I'd like to turn now to another aspect of the project status. I'm very happy to let you know that Questran has been working on something called Community Knowledge Open Library, CCOL. What you're seeing here is a picture of the interface. Those of you familiar with um, the bibliography Questran produces will recognize the interface. It's by the same technical service provider. What it allows is for community groups to make available what is called gray literature. So it's the kind of material that community groups produce all the time. PowerPoints, reports, annual reports, newsletters, that kind of thing to um, 
send it to us, we will list it. And what's really exciting about this resource, it will we will also make the resource itself available in PDF, full text, so that in the search bar or in the subject uh, headings on the left there, people can identify exactly what all of this material has in its contents and be able to use it for policy development, for research, for whatever they feel is important. So far, this open library, which is not yet launched, has over a thousand resources. We're working with over 25 partners, including coasters, but not Black Rock Group. I, I put yet, we hope to reach them and get their stuff on here. And the funder is the Secretariat. Please save the date. There is going to be a launch of this product in March. So where else are we with the project? We're busy uh, giving presentations and also um, applying to conferences to attend presentations. So one coming up is now National Council on Public History. We also hope to present at the Association for Critical Heritage Studies. And I've already given a couple of presentations to Library and Archives Canada and also to Canadian Historical Association. Oops. We have worked on a preliminary table of contents for our book. Thank you, Patrick, for making that happen. Uh, so far, this is the structure we've come up with. Chapter one is the enduring myth of the rich Anglos. That won't be the final title probably. Chapter two, building the English speaking communities. And then chapters three, four, and five, look at community groups uh, by geography. You can see there Montreal and Quebec City, coastal Quebec and non-coastal. And there will be some kind of photo essay, which should be tons of fun. When we get to the question period today, Patrick and I would love to hear from you about what you think about that structure. If you can come up with better ideas and or other ideas and also um, whether you want to be on the advisory committee. Tying it all together. I'm going to repeat what I mentioned at the beginning, drawing on primary and secondary sources, the People's History of English Speaking Quebec project will capture voices of ordinary English speaking Quebecers working in community groups. It will do so in order to preserve and share Quebec English speakers' history and promote their vitality and to amend the dominant narrative. And here's our working hypothesis based on our knowledge of communities and also that secondary literature, I quoted, and other things we've read. Focusing on community group history, the project will capture a wide range of English speaking Quebec knowledge. This includes knowledge of a wide range of ordinary people, including women and ethnocultural and regional communities, and knowledge about a wide range of topics, including culture, identity, politics, and relations among groups and with the majority and the state. It will reveal the groups as sites of inclusion, diversity and debate, and for building and asserting English speaking Quebec ways to belong in Quebec. We're mulling over stuff, lots of stuff. We have a lot to think through. Um, how to define ordinary people. Does that include elite ladies who created 19th century charities? Got it. We've got to talk about that. How to define community group? Does it include incipient labor and political organizations? How the perennial question, how to define English speaking Quebec? And then something common to every single project, how to keep it manageable, what to include and what to leave out. Here are some actions you can take. 
first of all, please save the date. I'm really convinced a lot of you would like to see the launch of our Community Knowledge Open Library, CCLL. If you have feedback on the project, write um, Patrick or me. If you want to be a partner to contribute material to CCLL, uh, please contact Patrick, who's the project lead. And always subscribe to QuestGrin newsletter for updates. And we'll put that URL in the chat. Just to repeat, the Secretariat funded the project. It funds CCAL and it's funding today's Lunch and Learn. Thank you to the Secretariat and to all of our partners who Patrick mentioned before. So that's it. Thank you, Lorraine. I see we've already got a few questions in the chat. So I'll start off with a question from uh, Ruby Pratka, who asked, what do you mean by vitality of memory? If Alain was here, he would be much better placed than I am to do that. But um, my understanding of Alain's very important contribution is to bring into the, the long-standing, decades-old discussion of community vitality, the notion that vitality is not is more than, for example, economic factors or demographic factors or institutional um, uh, completeness factors, that vitality of community also depends on cultural contributions and particularly how communities know about their past and to mobilize their knowledge and their histories for their own well-being. So we have another question from uh, Andre Rousseau, but also uh, Kayla Lewis Talusman asked, "What is the dominant narrative you refer to?" And I'm, you know, we've discussed this, Lorraine. We're talking about sort of the rich Anglo narrative. Perhaps you have more to say on on that. Yes, um, I didn't uh, explain it in any depth. What we find over and over in um, popular representations of Quebec history. And the point has been made specifically about the Quebec history program. Um, and I'd be happy to share some references on that is that English speaking Quebec is uh, misrepresented, underrepresented. I'll put it this way English speaking Quebec has always had, you know, what we can commonly call the 1%. So the elite group who dominated um, Quebec, English Quebec, and French Quebec. Unfortunately, um, the, the narrative tends to stop there and not give the full picture of who English speaking Quebec ever was, never mind where it is today. So our aim is to enrich and add complexity to that story, which we feel is not doing Quebecers, English and French and anyone else any good. We have another question from uh, Kayla Lewis Tildusman asking, what was the quote from Desiree Lacha about people being uh, creators of knowledge through experience? I'm happy to say not only did I look at Desiree's thesis, but I had a discussion with her. She's the uh, researcher in residence at Concordia University's library right now. Desiree um, has found through her work on Black, diasporic, French-speaking and Creole-speaking communities um, in Quebec, that it is valuable to expand our understanding of what we mean by knowledge. And thank you for asking that question, because it allows me to expand on a point I wanted to make. Often knowledge is captured in what is um, commercially published material. So for example, a book, which goes through an um, a publishing house and you know is distributed and in bookstores and so on. However, Desiree's point and what we're also trying to draw on, inspired by her, is that knowledge is far more widely held. In fact, everybody has knowledge. And we're trying, and what Desiree's point was was that even people who are illiterate have knowledge, including political knowledge that is worth paying attention to capturing, understanding, and, um, and sharing. And so what we find particularly exciting about our community knowledge open library is that it is capturing a much broader 
type of knowledge than the commercially published materials can make. And through our um, interpretive work through producing a book, not only are we going to make the material available through the open library, but we're going to give our understanding of it in our material. Question from Ruby Pratka. What form will the final project take? Book, website, exhibit? I mean, we've definitely talked about a book. And Lorraine presented this, the initial brainstorming we had around the five, the way we were going to divide it up. We did, we did discuss um, the possibility of having, you know, turning it into an exhibit, turning it into a website, but definitely the book was, was core, but also the resource uh, C-Call feeds into this project. Lorraine? Yes, those are the two immediate, the three immediate products to use project management jargon, the book, the, um, the website and networks. So we'll be expanding our networks and through an advisory board, expand, like sharing knowledge that way too. Susan O'Donnell, who I believe is your sister, Lorraine, um, asked, um, you know, the time frame. how far back are we going? And, you know, based on our initial discussions, we're going back to 1759, we're in the formal beginning of the English speaking community, but mostly focusing on 20th century, you know, more, more recent. We have to figure out what we mean by, as I was saying, by, by ordinary people and community group. So to give you an example, in the uh, 19th century in Quebec City, there were dock workers uh, who organized into what was later recognized as an incipient labor union. In fact, possibly the first Canadian labor union. Is that a community group? Well, in, uh, in its early uh, iteration, it was a benevolent society where they collected money for charitable purposes for their own members. So Patrick and I, I think the answer to your question will be depending on how we define community group, but we want it to be a wide enough, a big enough tent that we can go further back without turning it into a description, like a set of labor activities or um charities run by wealthy people so it's it's a complex question i wish we had a clearer answer but we'll work on it but uh, and, and i would add you know a lot of the knowledge gaps tend to be for the more recent period a lot of that 19th century stuff has been um researched in different bits and pieces and you know, it'd be interesting to sort of um bring it together but there are there, there, there's a lack of knowledge about you know more recent um history of community groups in the english-speaking community that's true, Patrick. It, I would add, there's a lot of knowledge, but it's not being captured. And that's, you know, a lot of the people in this room, I recognize many of the names are people who work with communities who know a lot of this stuff. In fact, it looks obvious to a lot of people, but it's it's a pretty closed system and we're trying to open it up. Alain asks, how can community groups contribute to this project? Hi, Elaine. Um, well, two ways. Um, first of all, those of you who are not already partners with the Community Knowledge Open Library, if they're English speaking community groups, um, please write to Patrick. Uh, will Patrick, maybe you can put your email address in the chat to ask him how to get themselves set up to start contributing to material to that open library. And secondly, um, if we decide to work with your group, if we decide to invite groups to participate in the project by, um, for example, making themselves available for interviews, please say yes. Uh, another question from Cisco Armstrong. Will there be a piece of the project that looks at the future knowledge, community-based visions, ambitions, ideals of the future of the English speaking community? As historians, we tend to look at the past, but we could look at the history of the of the of the visions. <laughs> I love that. I, this is going to be a, give me a chance to plug my sister's book, which maybe you can't see. Can you? You can't see that. That's annoying. That's the blur. It's called. So Susan O'Donnell is editor. We didn't plan this in advance. Susan O'Donnell is editor of a book called Letters from the Future. How New Brunswickers Confronted Climate Change and Redefined Progress. It's, it's a brilliant idea where she had, they had invited community leaders to write as if they're several decades in the future back to today's time to say, 
basically how much progress has been made in the future. Um, I never thought of doing that for C-Call, but Patrick, you know, we certainly could have some kind of fun event where we launch our book and ask people to, to project where they might see the, the communities 20, 30, 50 years down the road. Harriet McLaughlin, would such groups, would groups such as a knitting circle or crafts group in a small town whose members are solely English speaking, yet whose purpose is not necessarily promotion of English language culture, would their existence be relevant to, um, to this project? Uh, I love that question. I think so. What do you say, Patrick? We have, you know, it gets back to the question of how to define what we do. Not all the groups are um, necessarily groups that talk about never mind language being part of a minority language community. It might be de facto their situation without them having awareness of that. So, um, but there's still knowledge and there's still. Um, contributing to cultural well-being of communities. So I would think so. And certainly for the Community Knowledge Open Library, yes. Yeah, I mean, these are spaces of socialization. So indirectly, they contribute to vitality by being places where people get together, speak English. Um, certainly, if there's interesting stories coming out of these groups, they would be interesting to put into a book. If there's no stories, then it's hard to, you know, we can certainly mention them as different spaces of socialization. But yes, the answer is yes. Um, and Harriet, if you looking at it for sure, if you know of such a group, um, let us know. That would be great. Rachel Garber asks, "How can ordinary community members participate in this project?" Hi, Rachel. Uh, if you're interested in being on the advisory board, let us know. Rachel Garber is, um, I think, retired, but used to be very active with Townshippers Association, among other many activities um, to attend our events, to give your point of view. Rachel, if you know of groups that might be of interest for us to include with our Community Knowledge Open Library project, please let Patrick and me know. If this is a very common situation, um, Individuals who have worked with communities who have in their attic and basement piles of documents, um, we can talk to you about whether that material can be included in CCAL. So in other words, if you have, let's say old, I'm, I'm just speculating here, but let's say you have or know of someone who has old um, files in their computer or, or, or printouts of reports, newsletters, uh, PowerPoints and the like, let us know and we'll look into copyright issues because of course it might belong to the group and not the individual, but we can sort that out. We do have participating groups sign an agreement and the agreement has been reviewed by Concordia's legal office and we're very, you know, it's definitely um, provides a framework for participating that's to it, the advantage of both parties. Another question from Andre Rousseau, would you consider traditional media forms as contributors to the knowledge of cultural identity? Yeah, that's a great question, Andre. Um, so one of our lunch and learns that we hosted, that was actually one of our earlier ones with uh, Pierre-Olivier Bonnet. He has done an interesting study um, Here's another plug for a book. This time it's a Questgren book, which it's called, and I can't show it because it doesn't work with blur, but it's called um, Bill 101, the charter, Bill 101 in Quebec's English speaking communities. And in that book, excuse me, that article, Pierre Olivier traces the history of media coverage of English speaking community groups over time in reference, I should say to Bill 101. <clears throat> I think the media factors in in two ways, but obviously I'm, I'm speaking off the cuff. One is um, the content of the coverage is very, you know, it's, it's read and understood and used and known by community groups. Um, so it, it actually affects self image and a knowledge of how the image of communities is um, being shared in the broader community. Sometimes, 
you know, if only to say that's not what we meant, that's not who we are. And then the other way media is important for communities is for capturing the knowledge itself. So there are a number of community papers. Um, for example, Ruby is here, Ruby Pratka works or used to work anyway with uh, Quebec at QCT. Quebec Chronicle, Telegraph. Chronicle Telegraph. Wow, I drew a blank. At um, the Sherbrooke Record, these are smaller papers that tend to be close to the ground and uh, very knowledgeable and very much in tune with and in touch with communities and capture what's going on. So yes, they're important source. A question from Ruby. Um, basically, when is the book coming out? Um, in terms of our <laughs> timeline, we, our Ruby. initial timeline was one chapter, one year. So maybe five years from now. Because we've there got we other go. stuff to do with Questgrin. This is sort of, this is one of the many activities we do. Yeah, it's it's a glimmer in our eyes, Ruby. Ruby, we only have the table of contents on a PowerPoint slide. That's what that book is right now. But but we're keen, and we have lots of knowledge and material. We we just need to, you know, write it. <laughs> so Joe Graham asked, do we have a preference for donations to see called digital or hard copy? Digital is always preferable because it's always going to be digitized. However, we we can work with hard copy and digitize it ourselves. I encourage you to get in touch with us. Maybe I can ask a question of my own as I sort of go through the question. Um, the, the two examples you gave, Lorraine, of the people's histories were from the left, but there's other, you know, sort of the radical left. Um, there's other types of history claiming to be people's histories, things like um, uh, Jacques Lacourcière, the People's History of Quebec, Histoire Populaire du Québec. CBC came out with a People's History of Canada. These are very different visions. Basically, where does ours fit in? The, the examples I gave from Zinn and Morton, those were from leftist historians who had an influence on um, a whole, gen, like actually two generations, I would say, of historians working um, to uncover stories of workers of previously marginalized groups in order to bring about social change, as I mentioned. Uh, the, the term people's history is also used for something different, which is simply what I would call um, popular history. And interestingly, Jacques Lacourcière's book, for example, is translated, en français, c'est uh, l'histoire populaire. In English, it's not called the popular history, it's called people's history of Quebec. Um, that and the CBC uh, uh, people's history that Patrick referred to, which is both, I think, some kinds of publications, but it was also a TV series. Um, are what I would call popular history. So they do bring individuals into the story. They definitely um, make it in a readable, accessible style. And it, it's great. I'm not trying to minimize it. But their goals are different. I, my, to my understanding, they are not aiming to um, uncover group activity that's aiming to bring about social change. So they're not looking at groups that tried to bring about social change, nor are these books trying in themselves to bring about social change through that knowledge sharing and development. So that's how I would make the difference. Question of from Susan O'Donnell um, about, I guess, our methodology. Will we be asking the groups themselves to write the stories and then edit them, or are we doing more of an oral history thing? Yeah, so um, I mentioned that we're going to be informing ourselves better about a, a methodology called community-based um, action research. So the, the notion with community-based action research is that communities actually can, not can, do intervene at every step of a research project from defining it to setting its content to um, possibly producing the content and so on. Patrick and I have to discuss all that. We, I don't, so far, we're not talking about our book in itself as being uh, community-based action research. However, um, some of the other products that might come out of the book, such as oral histories uh, from the oral history interviews could involve that kind of writing project. And, um, it, it's it's a whole other endeavor, and that's what I was saying about trying to keep this manageable. Paul Zanazanian, who some of you know, and Patrick and I know well, 
He's a scholar at McGill and he developed uh, a template, which is, it's basically a, a structure that people can follow in order to help narratives, stories emerge. And um, we've talked with Paul and, and you know, one possibility is to use that tool that he's developed to create the kind of stories you're talking about, Susan. At this point, we don't have plans for it, but it's definitely a potential project. Question from Richard Boris. Uh, would our theme include the declining linguistic landscape of English place names, et cetera, in Quebec? Richard, it's such a great topic. Um, at this point, it's not what we have in mind because we're focusing on community groups, making the decision to go from people's history in general in other words, the, the Zin or, or Morton approach where we give the whole history of Quebec, but from the point of view of ordinary English speaking Quebecers, moving from that very grand project to something much more confined, which is history of English language community groups um, has, has drastically narrowed its scope um, and made it more manageable. The question of place names is a wonderful one, um, but not on our agenda at this point. Question from Andre Rousseau, First Nations, do we include them as part of the English speaking community um, and look at their historic narratives or narratives? Andre, you ask such great questions. Um, it's, it's a good one. So, uh, we at Questgren, we work already with some Indigenous communities and individuals. Um, and some of the English language community groups in that sort of umbrella of so called vitali vitality organizations have or work closely with Indigenous community members. So it's not to, to start out, it's not like a dichotomy of either you're English speaking or you're Indigenous, you know, there, there's a lot of interaction. Um, it's also a political question and one that we treat delicately and with respect. So my answer to you is, uh, if we can, we will, and we'll be um, working with communities to see what is possible. Yeah, I think, I think the answer is if Indigenous groups feel like they want to be part of this, then yes, but it certainly wouldn't, wouldn't, we wouldn't include it without the blessing of the Indigenous group in question. Um, what impact are you hoping this project will have? So Lorraine spoke about this in her presentation, but maybe if you can sum it up. You know, I, I don't want to sound like super grandiose, but I will. <laughs> we, we hope to start changing the narrative, as I said, so that when we talk about English speaking Quebec, it's truer to what people who are in those communities see. Um, we hope to expand knowledge among communities of ourselves, themselves. We hope to help support vitality through this kind of activity, through the interviews, through the CECAL project, through people gaining in well-being and in in that self-knowledge so those are our, our um what we hope to achieve and and as i mentioned um enriching the scholarly literature okay one final question from Mela sarkar who asked if we're interested in f input from and about the south asian feminist community who have english as a common language who've been here since the 60s uh, the answer is a resounding yes, I believe, Lorraine. Totally, Mela, for sure. Yeah. Let's be in touch. Um, the SAWC, I don't know if you're thinking of that group. But we, yes, we've done... thank, thank you, Lorraine. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I'll be, I'll be in touch. I'll be in touch, absolutely. That's what we want to hear. And uh, Andre asked about, in, in relation to the question on impact, how and to whom will this research be made available? To everybody, right? Yeah, so um, Questgren's network, we have about 800 people on our newsletter. So the very smallest group is that. But our publications um, will be public. They will be out there in the academic and intellectual community. And our book, 
we do want it to be um, highly readable. Patrick is excellent at that. He's a great writer. And uh, um, we hope to promote it and make it on everybody's bedside table in six years. So this is drawing to a close. So thank you all for attending today's event. And uh, in closing, I'd like to acknowledge that the event was made possible, again, through the financial support of the Secretariat pour relations avec le Québécois d'expression anglaise. Uh, Questburn also receives funding from the Department of Canadian Heritage and the Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities. Thank you again for being here, and we wish you all a great day. Happy holidays. See you next time.